In this video, I have my blood work analyzed by an obesity medicine specialist, Dr. Spencer Nadolsky, after I lost over 12 pounds in 30 days, and every single day I deliberately spiked my blood sugar. Dr. Spencer looks at my triglycerides, he looks at my overall metabolic health, he looks at my testosterone levels, which were freaking crazy after these 30 days. So this whole video is my entire conversation with Dr. Nadolsky about my blood work, my overall health, after deliberately spiking my blood sugar every single day. If you wanna see the entire video of me spiking my blood sugar every day and what happened. The link is in the description to watch that video. Make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel. Let's get into it. Dr. Spencer Nadolsky, could you give us a quick introduction to who you are and what you do? Yeah, I'm an obesity and lipid specialist physician and actually the medical director for Weight Watchers. Uh, I specialize in helping people lose weight, get metabolically healthier, and virtually all online uh, as I moved to the cloud some years ago. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to screen share my blood work, my blood work, and it's going to show you the blood work from before the glucose experiment to after the glucose experiment. And I just want you to go through and give me and everyone watching insight into what happened to my blood work after losing about 12 pounds in 30 days while deliberately spiking my blood sugar every day. I see your screen. So the one on the left is what was before the experiment. Yeah. So you can see the one the the one on the left has August 2023 below it and then the one on the right has September 2023 below it. Do you see that? Yep. Awesome. So we'll go through and, and this is a very comprehensive blood panel. So up here we have my cholesterol and triglycerides. We go we have all of that options. We have coagulation, we've got metabolic and endocrine health. We have uh glucose, hemoglobin A1C, insulin. We've got my liver health. We've got kidney and and uh metabolic function. We've got electrolytes, iron, red blood cells, white blood cells, vitamins, minerals, dietary fatty acids, tumor indicators. We got a lot. So you just tell me, we'll start from the top and you tell me what else you want to see. Yeah. The most important things uh, that I would look at in something in an experiment like this would be like your lipids and your glycemic measures. So, so do you want to just go through and, and tell me what you see and what you think from like the pre and post measurements? Yeah, if you look at your lipid panel, and for anybody listening, a standard lipid panel, you get a total cholesterol, you get an HDL cholesterol, and the HDL cholesterol, people think of it as the good cholesterol. It's a little bit of a misnomer, but it's that's the the stuff that's not going to cause heart disease. Whereas uh, the LDL cholesterol and anything non HDL cholesterol, that's kind of a marker for uh, the little particles that can cause heart disease. And in your case. You had barely any change in the HDL cholesterol. Some might think eating sugar would drop it precipitously. You had barely any change there. But if you look at the um, your non-HDL cholesterol at 135, which it shows it red there, that's where we start going, okay, it's probably a little bit of a risk factor there. You're now at 120. This is despite eating mostly sugar. <laughs> now, now, the thing is like, you know, if, if you get into the lipids, you know, probably more so that things like saturated fat, fiber can have an effect. I don't know what you did with your fiber intake. I don't know if you tried to keep it the same. Uh, I did. I tried to keep my fiber exactly the same. The, the only difference in this experiment was I had one meal a day where I deliberately spiked my blood sugar. So the rest of my nutrition was very good. It was like okay. fiber, moderate protein, like overall great nutri nutrient quality. But that one, the, and the purpose was to show people that spiking your blood sugar, at like having a donut, like you see all these videos of people being like, Oh my God, don't have one slice of bread or don't have like fucking fruit because it's going to spike your blood sugar. It's like they're reducing health down to one individual blood sugar spike. And that's not how it works. Did you notice, did you change how much saturated fat you're taking? So if you're having one meal specifically that was sugary in that usual meal, did you have more saturated fat and then now you didn't because that might make a difference as well no because i usually don't have much saturated fat to begin with i'm usually i'm not a big saturated fat like that's just not a huge part of my nutrition what i yeah. what I really did is i i just it was really more replacing what would have been more of a little bit of a balanced meal with uh carbs protein and a little bit of fat and to basically just being all sugar all sugar. And it's possible that just a little bit of that replacement of the saturated fat with sugar could have dropped this non-HDL. Hard to know, but you also lost weight, which also makes an effect there. I think what most people are going to hone in on though, is this triglyceride level, because mm -hmm. people think that eating tr uh, purely sugar increases your triglyceride level. You lost weight while eating more sugar. And despite that, 
you, you could say that it's not much of a change uh, or just a little bit less. So I think it's great to see that your triglyceride levels didn't just shoot through the roof uh, despite this uh, dietary change. So overall, I would say improvements in your lipid panel uh, despite uh, spiking your, your blood sugar uh, daily. Awesome. And so do you want to go through as well? Like, uh, so for example, when I'm looking at my lipid panel, I've got my LDL. So I genetically, which I believe like you, I genetically have a little bit higher cholesterol, my LDL cholesterol and my direct LDL, they were a little bit higher. Those actually improved, right? So it went from yeah. 105 and then 128 to 108. Like, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So this kind of goes along with the non-HDL. Some people are starting to look at non-HDL instead of just strictly LDL cholesterol, low density lipoprotein cholesterol. This is kind of a, a surrogate marker for those little proteins that start getting into your artery walls and starting uh, atherosclerosis and plaque and heart disease. And you can see you actually had a very robust change in your, uh, if you look at directly at direct LDL, as opposed to the calculation where that's where it says LDL cholesterol, that one's a calculation. The one Below that is a direct where they measure it directly instead of calculating it. And a 20 point drop is, is considerable. You could even consider that um, somewhat of a low drug like effect. And, it, you know, again, it may be because of you, you swapped something out of your diet um, that uh, maybe was holding it up there and the sugar actually uh, helped it go down, but it didn't worsen it and it didn't worsen your triglycerides. So, again, overall, this is a, a positive change in your lipid profile, your HDL didn't change, your triglycerides didn't change, but your LDL and non-HDL uh, levels did go down. And that's that's an overall improvement. And, and looking at lipoprotein little a, it was already in a good range. Would you yep. say it's also a, a significant improvement or is that just like, it's just, it is what it is? Yeah, it's hard to know if that's it's an improvement. I will say it's a good thing it didn't go up. Some people believe that, hey, carbs and, and sugar will make your L, LP little A go up and it's better to eat saturated fat. But in this case, if anything, yours went down. For anybody listening, this is kind of an important thing. They should probably get it at least one time in their in their life because it's a genetic marker that won't be picked up uh, by a normal standard lipid panel. And the fact that yours was low to begin with is great, but it, it actually went down with this experiment, which is interesting to see. Hard to know if clinically relevant or if it's just your normal changes, uh, variation uh, during the month, but uh, good to see that didn't go up at least. And I know APOB was not included on this, but can you talk about what you'd imagine APOB would be just looking at my lipid panel? Yeah, your apolipoprotein B would follow along with the 9-HDL was, and your 9-HDL dropped. So your apolipoprotein B would have gone down uh, likely, very likely. Uh, the non-HDL does a, a pretty good job at estimating the ApoB levels. Got it. Amazing. Now, do you want to see the uh, blood glucose, insulin, all that? Yes. Um, so there wasn't you didn't get an insulin before. Is that right? I did not. I fuck it. I made that. It doesn't matter. It yeah. honestly doesn't matter. So if you're looking at your insulin levels, those are very low. Now, some people can say these insulin levels can be spurious and all over the place, but yours being that low after eating more sugar, it, it, you're extremely insulin sensitive. This means that you are utilizing your insulin very well. Your, your tissues are, are responsive to insulin. Your, your body doesn't need to produce that much insulin to keep uh, your blood sugars at bay. So the fact that your insulin is, that's that's very low. That's stark low. Before, below five is, is great. Uh, and, and your hemoglobin A1C didn't change. Uh, I wouldn't expect it necessarily to, but some people might think that if you're spiking your sugars, uh, hemoglobin A1C is an average measure of your blood sugar over three months. They basically look at the blood cells and see how well they attach or how much they're attached to the, uh, the sugar is attached to the blood cells and measure this percentage of, of glycation. So yours didn't change despite spiking your blood sugars often. And then if you look at your fasting blood sugar, many people might believe it would go up since you're eating more sugar. This should cause more insulin resistance more uh, likelihood of prediabetes. Again, it's only a month, but yours went down. And this this intuitively should make sense. You were able to lose weight uh, and the energy balance probably makes the most uh, difference in people improving their uh, glycemic measures. But it's important to know that that's why looking specifically at blood sugar spikes by themselves is, is missing the, the forest uh, for the trees type of thing. So with your blood sugar, getting down to 78 fasting and then a 
fasting insulin, you're very insulin sensitive and you didn't have, you had improvements in your glycemic effects. It was really interesting because one thing I noticed throughout the experiment was that things that would spike my blood sugar a lot early on wouldn't spike my blood sugar as much later on. In that's, the that's really cool to see. I mean, you're, you're improving your insulin sensitivity as you went through the month mm. because mm. I mean, cause you're losing, you're losing adipose probably around areas you might not want adipose, but, um, fat tissue for anybody listening. So that's, that's why we even see like people that go on a very low calorie diet. If they have type two diabetes, they've done this in the UK but people that go on a very low calorie diet and they can put their diabetes or type two diabetes into remission. And it's simply from lowering the amount of adipose around organs that where it's not supposed to be. So even despite eating more sugar and losing weight, you improved your, your insulin sensitivity and glycemia. It's crazy. And the, one other thing I want to hit on here with you, especially because one of the, the, a huge trend right now is people saying, well, I have insulin resistance, so I can't lose weight. And that was one of the big things I got throughout the experiment was it's different for you because you have good insulin sensitivity, but clearly my insulin sensitivity sensitivity improved through this. Can yeah. you talk to let's, if someone has insulin resistance, does that mean all of a sudden they can't lose weight in a calorie deficit? No, it's, it's a, it's a little bit of a misnomer. And in fact, those individuals are what we call like lipolytic because their insulin is actually not their insulin sensitivity isn't working so well their insulin isn't working as well in their body they're actually breaking down more fat it's the fact that they're in too much of a calorie surplus or not in a calorie deficit so what you could see you could give them basically a 800 calories of just pure sugar and what you would see is that they would actually improve their insulin sensitivity. The, the issue of what makes it hard to lose weight with those with insulin resistance is mostly that of a, of a dysregulation of their appetite. So mm -hmm. while they feel that they're in a calorie deficit, they feel they have an increased perceived amount of effort. So they're like, I'm, I'm doing everything I can. I, I believe that they're doing everything they can. And they believe that it, it is very difficult. But the, the fact of the matter is they're not in a calorie deficit. And I know that they'll they'll get mad at this when you say this, and you actually have to when you're talking to a patient, you have to be careful because you don't want to gaslight them. Like, no, you're not. Right. You're not. You're not in a calorie deficit. But it's 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 just a fact. Right. And so what you what you talk about is this disease and dysregulation of their appetite, and their body might be trying to hold on to adipose from an appetite standpoint, not actually holding on to it while in a calorie deficit. Uh, because when you put them in a calorie deficit, that's what actually helps them resolve their type two diabetes and, and they can lose plenty of weight and it's fine. It's not going to stop them from losing weight. Makes total sense. Is there, is there anything else that you want to see in this blood panel? Is that all you're really interested in? I think so, so I'll, I'll take a look at your testosterone, I think is interesting. Go up, back okay. up for a second. Uh, I won't talk about the other things, but, um, there we go. So yeah, if you look at your testosterone levels. I didn't even notice that, dude. That's yeah. wild. <laughs> yeah, you have you had a massive and now look, anecdotal case study. But as I lost, I didn't even yes. look at this yet. Holy this shit. This is pretty interesting. I'd have to ask you about your symptoms and your your if, if you had improved libido or didn't change in libido. But this is important to know because we have a lot of patients that come in with, you know, what the, the scientific term is, medical term is hypogonadism. Yeah. And their testosterone will be low. And and they'll want to throw up testosterone at these people and yours weren't low enough in the beginning to consider medicine anyway but like when you help these people that are struggling with their weight uh lose weight and they have these hypogonadal levels like levels below 300 uh, nanograms per deciliter that's the uh the the units there they will actually boost up their testosterone a lot with wow. weight loss and then they'll feel better so the fact that you actually like <laughs> increased by, I mean, you, that's, that's not a small increase. That's, that's a, that's a quite double. Yeah. And then if you look, there's, it looks like you got a free testosterone there below it. If I had to guess that's yeah. what that was yours that went up as well. Yeah. It's so, a um, so it didn't go down despite weight loss. So interesting, uh, again, case study anecdotal, but, uh, maybe related to the weight loss, um, despite the sugar. Dude, that's crazy. I didn't even look at that number before we got on this call. That's nuts. Wow. So, I mean, what it really boils down to is if we want to lose body fat, we need to be in a calorie deficit. And yeah. generally speaking, if you if you lose body fat in a caloric deficit, your 
up to a point going to see improved health markers? Yeah. It, biomarkers won't be able to tell dietary quality to mm -hmm. a point. So there are non-body weight related factors that we just won't know for long periods of time. But when you're looking at biomarkers related to metabolic health, it is closely related to body composition. And so like, dis despite whatever you eat, if you're in a calorie deficit and the excess adipose tissue that you had was causing the, the, the bad biomarkers, the unhealthful biomarkers, and you lose that adipose from any type of calorie deficit, it doesn't matter what type it is, you will see improvement seen this time and time again with various studies and you've uh, showcased it right here uh, in this. Wow, man, Spencer, thank you so much. This has been incredibly helpful. I'll make sure we put your, uh, your handles where people can follow you here and in the, the description of the video. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you. Have a wonderful day. Anytime.